week one of Margaret Joseph's book, Caviar Dreams on a Tuna Fish Budget, or Caviar Dreams Tuna Fish Budget, How to Survive in Business and in Life. Tonight, we're breaking down the first four chapters. Did you get a copy? Have you been reading it? Are you listening to the audio? Let me know what the vibe is. Yes, we were worried, Zach. Can't get into the, can't wait to get into the book. Oh, you were, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was late. Thank you for the first three badges, Alvy Knights girl. Get it, get it, get it. Ow, ow, throw them hips, girl. Boom, 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 boom. Oh. All right, welcome on in, guys. Let's dive in. All right, so the book is called Caviar Dreams, Tuna Fish Budget, How to Survive in Business and in Life. And tonight we're breaking down chapters one through four. Next Tuesday, we'll be breaking down chapters five, six, seven, and eight, four chapters a week. So next week, we'll be breaking down the next four chapters. Chapter one is called Raised by Wolves. And Margaret opens up about, or opens talking about how she was basically born as an adult and she never had a real childhood because Marge Sr. was just crazy and all over the place and loved to party and loved to drink and just wasn't ready for that type of responsibility. She talks about how her Hungarian, she talks about her Hungarian culture growing up and how she was really skinny and how that was really frowned upon in the Hungarian culture because they don't like when you're skinny, they like you plump and thick. They like some curves. And she talks about how her mother was always dressed for the nines because her mother always dressed her to the nines because she was basically like Marge Sr.'s little doll. And she loved, and Marge Sr. just loved to dress her up and bring her around as the perfect little accessory. But she says that both of her parents were both fresh off the boat, Hungarian, but her father wasn't really around very much. So she was primarily raised by Marge Sr. and by her grandparents. She says that her dad was a bad boy. You know, our favorite kind. We love the bad boys. Well, actually not our favorite kind because once we find out what kind of guy he was, he just, he wasn't dad material. And that's just how Marge Sen- Marge Sr. liked them. She liked them bad and not dad material. But Margaret says that she really didn't notice her dad not being around, that to her, it was pretty much just normal. She's like, oh, I just got a mom. Okay, that's cool. I'm fine with that. Where's my dad and the mom? And Marge Sr. would be like, oh, we're divorced. He's not around. And Marge Sr. and Margaret would be like, okay, cool. Who needs a dad? I mean, basically, this day and age, who needs a dad anymore? Okay. I did it without one. I'm not still better. I'm not still hurting. <laughs> but um, she, yeah, she didn't really notice. She kind of just got accustomed to it and used to it. And I guess when you're like a kid, like you don't really know any different other than what you're brought up. In, you know, you don't know any exposure until you kind of see other families or other kids with a different situation. But I guess for you, your upbringing is just your norm. You know, nobody else can compare it to what you have because what you have is just what you have. You don't really know any different. So to her, it was normal. But her father was apparently verbally abusive, physically abusive to her mother. So ditching him was probably like ultimately for the best because, obviously, well, as you'll learn, Marge Sr. did not have a great picker. But she was a single mom. She loved to party. So Margaret often stayed with her grandparents who were very Hungarian and like didn't even always speak English. I think her grandfather did, or one of her grandparents didn't even speak English. So, you know, sometimes there were language barriers, but um, she says that her mom and her grandmother did not always get along and that her grandmother would call Marge Sr. a gypsy whore, which is kind of like a prostitution whore, but you don't get paid for it and you don't get books written about you for it. Well, actually you do get books written about you for it because now we have Caviar Dreams Tuna Fish Budget. So whether you're a gypsy whore or a prostitution whore, doesn't matter because you'll still have a book written about you as long as you're a whore. She also references this guy, Wayne, who's her mother's boyfriend, who she actually seems to really like. And she says that Wayne really loved her mother and she doesn't understand why because Marge Singer was a hot mess express. But she talks about how growing up she was a kid, but she knew all her parents, all her, her mom's friends' business. She knew all the business, what was going on in the clique, okay? From a very young age. And, but the good thing was that, you know, yes, she was included with all of her mother's friends, but the good thing was it also exposed her and it also taught her about like inclusivity because her mother was friends with a gay couple. And so Margaret, as a young girl, that was her first exposure into just like loving and accepting, you know, people that are gay. And she's like, that's, that was great because it taught me from a very young age to be very accepting and inclusive of other people. But sadly, although Margaret loved Wayne, 
she'd have to keep her mother's boy toys quite a secret because her mother was not very good at just having one boyfriend. She would have many boyfriends and a lot of the times they happened to be married. So her mother obviously had great taste in men. But Margaret Sr. wasn't good at responsibility. She wasn't good at monogamy. I don't really know what she was. Well, she was good at looking nice. She always made it. She always looked nice. She was bad at cleaning and keeping the house together and bad at, you know, probably being a mom. But she was very good at looking cute, you know, and sometimes looking cute is is, is a job in, in and of itself. OK, but she writes about how difficult her childhood was being surrounded by a lot of partying. But she remembers that her mom gets she remembers her mom getting ridiculously drunk and embarrassing her and how the other parents would talk about her crazy mom. They'd be like, oh, that's Margaret. She's the crazy mom. Oh, my God, that's Margaret's mom. She's the floozy. Oh, she's still so and so's husband. Yeah, that was Margaret's mom. And she would like remember all the other kids talking about that. And a lot of you guys, if your parents you're probably the one talking about so-and-so's mom and she's crazy, right? If you're a parent, you know that there's that one little girl and that one little girl has a crazy mom and nobody wants to fuck with her mom because she'll probably steal your husband, right? Right. That was probably my mom. Well, yeah, my mom was young and she stole some husbands. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Um, I got it from my mama. I got it from my mama. But she writes about how she doesn't really know what it's like to have a mom because she never really had one. And that was kind of sad. That was a little endearing. Um, but she's like, you know, I can laugh about it now, but I really was raised by wolves. And you know, she's like, I've told Marge Senior this before that you that she wasn't much of a mother. And, you know, she's like, it is what it is. I, I wish I would have had a mother. It would have been nice to have a mother, but I didn't. But she does say that, you know, eventually Marge did settle out and she gives her a lot of credit for being a very terrific grandmother and for really being there for her son. And then she ends each chapter with life lessons. So the first chapter's lesson, lesson number one, is that you can't choose your start in life, but you can choose how it impacts your decisions later down the road. Ain't that the truth? You can't choose the cards that you're dealt, but you can choose how you play the cards. Are you going to play them? Are you going to fold? Are you going to dip out of the game altogether? No. You're going to play and you're going to win, 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 win. You do you, boo, and you make it work. And then lesson number two from Margaret from this chapter is the earlier you realize that you have to advocate for yourself, the better. Which is kind of sad knowing that this is like the chapter about her like childhood and she's like talking about like having to advocate for herself. But she talks about how like she was really independent and she kind of carried herself. And she didn't really have a mother to guide her and her parents didn't even or her grandparents didn't even really speak a lot of English, but she loved and adored her grandparents. So it's good that Marge Sr. had the grandparents to kind of lean on, even though her mom called her a gypsy whore. Then we get into chapter two and chapter two is called spend your last dollar on lipstick, which life lessons to, to live by. I mean, I wouldn't say lipstick because I don't wear lipstick, but you get what I mean. Um, you always want to look cute. So young Margaret would always start her day off with the breakfast of champions. And that was a breakfast of coffee and Oreos. And yes, as a child, she would drink coffee and her mother was fine with it. And she was just like, who cares? Her mother didn't care. She's like, who cares? We're European. And so that was her mother's excuse for everything. We're European. So anytime, you know, something seemed a little unorthodox, it was just because they were European. And I was like, shit, I, I need to be more European in my own life. I'm down for this vibe. Let's get it, get it. Well, maybe not Oreos. Maybe if they were like gluten-free vegan Oreos, gluten-free non-dairy Oreos, sure. But right now we're all on a sugar cleanse. So we're not even talking about Oreos, right? Who said Oreos? I didn't bring that up. Fuck you. Um, so anyway, her mom basically let her call all the shots in her life, which made her fiercely independent. She says that Marge Sr.'s priorities just, they changed on the daily and she didn't really enjoy cleaning she didn't enjoy doing laundry that rather than doing laundry she would just rather buy her a whole new wardrobe and toss out the old and buy some new she wasn't great at money management either very clearly her mother loved to spend she would spend all of their electricity money on like a new pair of shoes and a dress and a purse and things that she really didn't need need but that she wanted and she wanted to look cute. Now you want a cookie? Yeah, I want a cookie too. I want an Oreo cookie. I want a fucking Oreo cookie. And I don't even really eat Oreo. I don't eat Oreo cookies. Well, now they have gluten-free Oreo cookies and those are actually pretty good. But if anything, I like JoJo's from Trader Joe's because those are gluten-free and dairy-free as well. And those are really good. But anyway, she says that um, 
she's glad that she didn't end up like Marge Sr. where, you know, Marge Sr. just spends a bunch of money, buys a lot of clothes, buys a lot of shoes. But Marge's always like, I always spend within reason. I know how to budget. I know how to not spend well beyond my means. And that's basically how Marge Sr. showed affection too, is by buying her stuff. She would give her everything she could ever need, everything she would ever want. She would take her on shopping sprees, but she would often have like this really like erratic behavior where like in the, in the middle of the night, she'd be like rearranging furniture and like doing all sorts of just like living wild hours. And just like, it was not a cute vibe or a stable environment for a child. But basically Marge Sr. would, would blame it on her diet pills, AKA speed. Her mother was also very open with her, like when um, there was a moment where she was telling Margaret, she's like, oh, well, you would have had a brother, but, you know, Wayne made me have an abortion. And Margaret was like, oh, okay, I guess I, well, maybe I wanted a brother. And Marge is like, oh, oh, well, too bad. Your brother, you know, Planned Parenthood handled that for us. Wayne but blame Wayne Wayne wanted it and poor young Margaret like didn't even understand like what Wayne did she probably thought like Wayne I don't know what she thought Wayne did with the baby but Wayne did something but one thing her mother would not stand for was anybody picking on Margaret okay because there was an incident where there was a nun and the nun went and she pulled on Margaret's little pigtails like she was Siggy Flicker or like she was Danielle Staub just like pulling the pigtail pulling the ponytail but in, in this sense, Margaret was little and she had little ponytails. And so she went off on the nun and she was like, no way, Jose, you are not going to do that to my daughter. You're not going to come at my daughter. If you come after me, I'll send Jesus after you. And then she stormed out. Um, but ultimately, Marge Sr. and Wayne didn't end up working out. Shocker, spoiler alert. But Margaret remains very close to him to this day. She says that she's closer to Wayne than Marge Sr. is to Wayne these days, which I guess would be true. Like, why would you want to be friends with your ex? Marge Sr. doesn't want to fuck with Wayne. She's fucking five other dudes. But whatever. Wayne seems to really love Marge Sr., but, you know, she just wasn't ready to give up that ratchet life. And the rat, you can't choose the ratchet life. The ratchet life chooses you. And the ratchet life chose Marge Senior, and they weren't ready to let her go. And so she's still living that life. Good for her. I mean, not good for anybody around her, but good for her. But whatever. It taught Margaret a lot. That relationship, her mother, all of the upbringing. But she said that she also learned from her mother how to be a really good businesswoman. But the, the one trait that she wishes she didn't get from her mother was her terrible taste in men. Luck, Margaret tried her best and luckily she tried to like learn from those lessons as we get into the future chapters. I don't know how much she actually learned, but you know, tis what it is. Her mother, she did say, though, that she felt very secure in her mother's love because her mother was very affectionate. Her mother always would hug her and tell her how much she loved her. So even though she wasn't able to be like a very good provider, she was still very loving. She was still very affectionate. Um, I don't know, like reading these chapters, these first two chapters and reading about Margaret's mom, like also kind of reminded me a lot about like my parents and you know my upbringing like my grandparents very much picked up the slack for my parents my father not verbally or, or physically abusive but just not really in the picture not really involved um you know my mother had me in high school so she wasn't ready to be a mother she wasn't ready to settle down or have any sort of responsibility but I mean reading this I was like but I know my mother loved me she loved me a lot and she had a giant heart for me she just didn't know how to be a mom she didn't know how to be responsible she didn't know how to do a lot of things but I know that she really loved me and I think that's probably why she chose to not have you know, much responsibility in my life and to pass that buck off onto my grandparents is because she knew in loving me that she could trust them with me or she could trust me. She could trust they would take care of me. I mean, ultimately, very similar, similarly to Marge, I wish I would have had more of a mother and my relationship with her now is very different. It's, it's grown and evolved a lot, but it's like you wish that you had you know, those parents, even if you accept what the circumstances were, you still wish that you had them. And that's what she said. She's like, you know, I, I was very secure in my mother's love for me. She just wasn't a great mother and she wasn't very responsible. But she says that, um, you know, Mar that Marge Sr. really did love her despite her demons and despite her vices. She tried the best that she could. And aside from, you know, 
aside from having her vices, she also bought her a lot of really nice shoes and a lot of really nice clothes. And that is always a bonus. But Marge Sr. was definitely a big spender and everywhere they went, eventually Margaret Sr. moved, Marge Sr. moved on from Wayne and she found a new man and this new man was Joe. Um, yeah, she did the best that she could, LV Knight's girl. The, everyone's just doing the best that they could. I don't think anyone's ever prepared to be a parent, but you know, we're all just doing the best that we can, right? But Marge Sr. left, she ditched Wayne and then she found Joe and Joe was her new man and Joe treated her well. He spoiled her, he bought her cars and he would give her money. And, you know, she was just living that high life with Joe. But, you know, one of the bad things about Joe is that he loved to smoke and he was also Margaret's friend's godfather. And on top of that, he was married. So, you know, there was that too. But <laughs> Marge Sr. really knew how to pick him. She said that all, all the other moms would often, like I said earlier, shun Marge Sr. because they were afraid that she would steal her man. But yet here she was out here stealing people's men. So it's like, you can't like not be afraid that she's going to steal your man if she's out here stealing men. Hello. Luckily, Marge, found, or not Marge, but Margaret, found a new friend and her new friend was Katie and Katie's mom was actually very welcoming to Marge Sr. because I guess she didn't have a man worth stealing and so she didn't think Marge Sr. was going to steal her man. Hide your kids, hide your wife, hide your kids, hide your man. There's a husband stealer out there. So they had a thing, about, I mean, I guess the other women, I don't know. I mean, well, I mean, if you're insecure and somebody's out there stealing husbands and you know that your husband's probably going to be having a wandering eye, then yeah, you're going to need to hide your husbands from the from the husband stealer, from the home wrecker. She never calls her mom a home wrecker, even though her mom wrecked quite a few homes, like with the sledgehammer, like she really wrecked them, like Hurricane Katrina. So, I mean, <sighs> Marge Sr. was a vibe. But... I mean, she said that not only did she hit on the husband, the fellow mom's husbands, but Margaret said that Marge Sr. would even hit on her, like her high school boyfriends, which I mean, Marge Sr., my God. But Margaret talks about losing her virginity. She was only 15. She lost it to Chris. Chris was her first, like, one true love boyfriend, and he was great. And Marge Sr. found out by reading Mar Margaret's diary, and she had a total hissy fit. And then Marge Sr. and her married boyfriend, Joe, were like, oh, my God, we're so disappointed in you for having sex, Margaret. But Margaret continued to have sex and didn't really take them seriously because Joe was married and... Marge Sr. knew that he was married. So she's like, you guys aren't really, you know, the people to be taking love, dating, and sex advice from. Okay, thank you very much. But she says that the sex was fabulous. She really enjoyed it. She really enjoyed her boyfriend, Chris. She said that they would eat, and then they would bone, and then they would sleep, repeat. Eat, bone, sleep, repeat. Eat, bone, sleep, repeat. Hi, Linz Marie Olson. I love you too. Obsessed with the podcast, but never get to the jump on here like oh well welcome Linz. welcome to the live welcome to the live well tonight's book club so we're recapping margaret joseph's book caviar dreams tuna fish budget so it's not our typical lives but we're we're live together and we're gonna i'm chatting we're chatting but anyway she kept up with her boyfriend chris and they were you know they would hit it and quit it throughout the years i'm like great like we all have a chris right you know you just kind of you keep in contact until you're like in a relationship and in between relationships you have a chris and you have a chris and you bang him and you have good times and you eat sleep what no what was it eat bone sleep repeat eat bone sleep repeat and that was just the cycle but whatever Basically, long story short, oh, and then she ended up finding her husband, Jan. So Chris was the booty in between Jan. And then eventually Joe. Well, Joe also became the booty during Jan, but we'll get to that in the later chapters. Long story short, to recap chapter two, her mother was a riot, a real who, and Chris was some real great sex. So there's that. Then we get into the life lessons from chapter two. Lesson number one is when you have children, remember that you are their parent first before being their friend. Great lesson, Margaret. And then we, she gave us lesson number two. And lesson number two is in, adult, in adulthood, knowledge is power. But in childhood, there's a fine line before it's a loss of innocence. That sounds like a housewife tagline, but a really long one. So in adulthood, knowledge is power, which is very true. The more you know, the more you guys you can blow. But in childhood, there's a very fine line before it's a loss of innocence. Which, very true, Margaret. Then we get into chapter three. And chapter three is called the leader of the pack. 
And Margaret says that, you know, she was that girl that would get sent home from school for not wearing any underwear. But like, it wasn't her fault that she wasn't wearing any underwear because her mom just was terrible at doing laundry. And like, how is that her fault? Hi, Australia. Hi, Diana in Australia. But she says that keeping the house in order and buying milk was just not on the list of priorities for her mother. But they were always stocked on beauty products. They were always stocked on clothes and they always had really cute shoes. So priorities, obviously. She did, however, make New Year's Eve a real treat and a real event. Marge Sr. would always kind of, she would take everyone out to the manor in West Orange, New Jersey. And eventually this became like a really special place in Margaret's life. And she says that um, Marge just, she would go all out and there was no expense that wasn't paid. You know, she would make sure everybody had a great time. She would take Chris and his family and they just really had a really bang out time. And it was like their fashion event of the year. She also says that Margaret, that Marge Sr. was always working or she was always sleeping and not just sleeping with men, but like sleeping, sleeping because she was exhausted from her high life. So what she would do is she would wait for Marge Sr. to fall asleep. And then she would go and get her friend Katie, who at this point was nicknamed Stubbs because she was short and stubby. And I, I assume she also had like stubby thumbs too, because when someone says thumbs, I just think like stubby thumbs. But I don't have stubby thumbs. I have like nice long hands. Somebody told me I have sexy hands today. I was like, ooh, I'll choke you. <laughs> JK. Um, I'd prefer to be choked, to be honest. But um. <laughs> Anyway, they would wait for Marge Sr. to fall asleep and then her and Stubbs would take the car out and then they would dress up like strippers and then they would sneak off to New York at 16 years old and they'd go to club. They would sneak into clubs and then they would dance with all these random men. And then one night they met this guy named Chris. That's not his real name, but that's what she named him. She's like, we met Chris. And Chris took us back to his apartment on the Upper East Side so that Stubbs could bang him. Bangers, but but bangers. But she ult- Stubbs ultimately didn't end up banging him because his dick was way too big. And when your nickname is Stubbs, it's like, it's because you're compact, you're like fun sized. And when a guy has a dick that's like this big, I don't like big dicks, big dicks fucking scare me. I don't know, thank you, thank you next. However, Stubbs was afraid because apparently she was expecting him to have a stubby dick and he didn't hit a very large one. And so she ran out of his room and she ran to where Margaret was. Margaret was cuddling with the roommate. And she's like, we gotta go because his dick is bigger than my body. So she ultimately didn't end up banging him and they ended up jetting out of there, which in my head, I was like, well, good, because BD energy scares me. No, I don't mind big dick, big D energy, Alicia. Big D energy is actually very attractive. Big D, on the other hand, is not very attractive. Energy, cool. Physicality, no thank you, okay? Ouch. Yeah, exactly. Ouch. Nobody wants that like you know when guys like oh yeah I'm 11 inches I'm like bye 11 inches that doesn't sound normal like hit up Ripley's believe it or not you know go to the the book of world records no thank you six inches is my limit maybe if I like you I'll give you that extra half an inch maybe we'll go to six and a half but other than that thank you next I'm good anyway like I said, she didn't bang him. They jetted out of there. But on their way home, she ended up rear-ending another car. And the other family was like, oh, my God, I can't believe you rear-ended us. But Margaret's like, well, I'm sorry. But, like, my car is actually damaged because Stubbs ended up banging her head on the windshield. And, you know, stupid Stubbs ended up banging her head on the windshield. I'm a seven. You're a, Oh, seven is your limit. I thought you said your dick size was seven. I was like, Alicia, what? What are you not telling me here, girl? But anyway, they get into a car accident. They rear end another car. Stubbs hits her head on the windshield and ends up cracking it. And she's like mad at Stubbs for cracking it. And then she's like, we got to go. Like, I I don't have time to sit around and like try to wait for an insurance company. Because first of all, we're underage. We've been drinking, or I don't think they've been drinking, but they're underage. They didn't have a real license to drive. So they, it was a hit and run. And then she went home and then they went back into their PJs and they went under bed and ended up like going to sleep. And the next morning, they're like, oh, wow, mom, it looks like a tree branch fell on your windshield when there was no fucking tree branch around. But like a tree branch fell. No, you're a 10, a 10. No way. A 10 inch penis sounds scary. Who wants a 10 inch penis? Who in the right mind? Is there anybody in the live right now that would actually enjoy a 10 inch penis? Like men, other men, I know I'm a man. I don't have 10 inches. I'm seven and a half. That's me. 
I shouldn't have revealed that. I don't know why I revealed that I haven't even been drinking, but whatever. Um, 10 inches is way too much. Thank you. No, thank you. Okay. There is nobody in the live chat right now that would be like, yes, I would love a 10 inch dick. Like men need to learn that. Stop like trying to say that you have like a nine inch dick. Cause that's like, no, thank you. Okay. Nine. No, no nines, no eight. Oh, now, no, my limit is seven and a half. Oh my God, Alicia, stop. Um, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. Okay, this is live. I can't even edit this out. Um, okay, let's move on. See, nobody, nope, nope, nope. See, gentlemen, if there is a man that is listening here, nobody wants a 10 inch penis, okay? No, thank you. So if you have a five incher, solid. If you have a six incher, great. You know, nobody... Nobody needs anything that big anywhere near them. Thank you very much. But anyway, they snuck back home. And I guess to this day, Marge Sr. never even knew that they ended up sneaking out and and going to New York and dressing like hookers and dancing like men and spending the night in their apartments or almost spending the night in their apartments. Like, wild. Anyway, she says that... Um, excuse them. Well, they were quite the duo, Stubbs and Margaret, I will say. But she says that, you know, despite her partying way, she was also a very hard worker in high school. Worked very hard, loved to make money. And she would always invest it, like Carrie Bradshaw, into her wardrobe. And she was working all the she was working her way up the real retail ladder, trying to get into more like top luxury stores that she could do luxury retail. And she wanted to just, you know, keep putting herself out there. She was great at it. The people, the bosses, the store managers loved her because she was great at pushing sales. She fit the part. She looked great. She was always investing in her wardrobe. So she knew that, that would help her get ahead as well. She was just working her way up. And then eventually she found herself working at Stein's Shoe Store in Pleasantville, New Jersey. And there's when she started hooking up with her store manager, Victor. And Victor was a very hot, hunky Latin guy. And she was like, yes, I'll do anything with you. And he's like, okay, you want to do some Coke? And she's like, I won't do that with you. And he was like, damn. And she's like, I knew better than to, you know, do Coke with him. She's like, I'll sleep with my boss or I'll sleep with my manager but Coke is where I draw the line. She's like, I knew better than that. I was like, good for you, girl. Standards. But anyway, wildly enough, it was at their holiday Christmas party where she found out that Victor wasn't so single and that Victor had a wife and the Victor's wife was pregnant and she was going to be having a baby soon. And so Margaret said that that relationship ended real quick because she didn't know that Victor had a wife and she didn't know that the wife was pregnant. And she, she nipped that in the bud. But she went on to work at a uh, a jewel uh, the department the sorry the jewelry department at a Bloomingdale's and then after that she ended up becoming a cocktail server and she got the job for cocktail server through her friend Nicole who I believe she met at Bloomingdale's then Nicole's like yeah Bloomingdale's isn't really my vibe and so she's like I have a husband and my husband runs this joint and so she's like you can come here because we can still be friends and you can be a cocktail waitress and he'll get you the job and and she went and she would serve cocktails and it was great until the husband ended up hitting on Margaret and I'm just like god everybody is just hitting on Margaret like Margaret must have been a real catch back in the day but she says that that didn't end up going anywhere because obviously he was married to her friend Nicole so like you can't be banging you can't be banging your boss when he's married to your friend. But then it ended up working out because, well, they didn't end up hooking up, but it ended up working out still because Nicole ended up running off with a guy that she was secretly seen on the side. And then homeboy was left by himself and he never ended up sleeping with Margaret, but you know, he didn't have anybody to sleep with at that point because his wife left him. <sighs> Margaret said that she was great at school. She just hated going to school. She hated going to class. She especially hated gym class. She even one time ran into her gym teacher at a club once when she had snuck an out and he was dancing with them. I was going to buy them drinks. And then she's like, good. Now I got blackmail on you and you better not ever make me go to gym class ever again. And I'm going to pass this class and you're not going to rat me out because if you do, I'm going to rat you out and say that you were at a club with underage girls and that you were trying to sleep with us. And he was like, damn. And so that ended up getting her out of gym class. Thankfully, she passed gym and she made it into FIT in New York. But before she could graduate high school, her grandfather ended up dying, which was really sad. And it broke her mother. So to celebrate his life, they ended up 
you know, taking the money that he left them. They took this big extravagant trip around Europe. They went to visit their homeland. They went to visit some of his family out in Germany. And they just had this big old shebang trip. They would even like, they've got their hair done like in Paris. And they were just like, they were doing the damn thing. And alas, she finally had to return for her first semester at FIT. But that's also where she got, uh, she had an internship on Fifth Avenue. And she was really excited about it because it was in fashion. And she was like, yes, this is my job. I'm like, I got this. Um, so that she was really excited for the opportunity. And her boss, Larry, ended up coming on to her. And she did not like that because she was not interested. She was not into him and she wasn't interested in sleeping with him. But she, she was like, look, I didn't want to, but I was young and I was impressionable. And it seemed like a really bright opportunity that was right in front of me. And she just, she felt like she was pressured or kind of had to. She was in college. She needed the credit. She needed to kind of, you know, impress her boss. And she was like, this, like, it just, I felt pressured and did it out of obligation. She says that at the time, like she didn't really think that it was that big of a price to pay. She was like, it was five minutes. And, you know, he just, it, he promised to give me everything I needed from this opportunity if I just gave him five minutes of my time. And so she's like, I did it. I didn't do it because I wanted to, but I did it because I felt pressured and I felt obligated to. And I felt like this is what I needed to get ahead and do what I needed to do. And she's also like, and no one really talked about it. So it kind of just felt like what you were supposed to be doing. She says that it, it really just didn't feel like a big price to pay at the time, but over the years, like it weighs on you. And she's like, stuff like that, just it stays with you. And you eventually do kind of learn or not learn, but you process it and you regret it because you're like, gosh, I wish I would have had a little more, you know, confidence in myself or pride to be like, no, I'm not going to do this. I don't want to do this. And even though you're pressuring me into doing this, and even though you have authority and power over me, that doesn't mean that I have to do this. But again, she was a young girl. Like, I don't think you really knew any better. And the times then were very different from the times now. It wasn't very female empowerment back in the 80s as much as, you know, people are open and talking about this and not accepting this stuff like they did before. But she said that her boss, Larry, also had a counterpart who also, Ronnie, who also, you know, really liked Margaret. And so the two of them would kind of compete for her attention. Both men were married, but luckily she said she never slept with Ronnie, but she, you know, she did end up sleeping with Larry. So that Larry abused his power. And in her retelling of the story, it seems like she really regrets sleeping with him, but she did it for the job and she did it because she felt like she had to. But she says that she had a, a hard time kind of processing it and therapy ultimately helped her through it. And she's glad that more women are now speaking out about it. And we can finally put like that whole culture to bed and put it to rest. And then we get to the life lesson of this chapter. And in this chapter, her life lesson is you're going to be put in situations that you're uncomfortable with, but don't let that fear paralyze you. Make the best decision you can in the moment and move on. Even if it's not the greatest decision in retrospect, you're like, God, I wish I would have made a different decision. All you can do is just accept it and move forward from it and learn how to process through it but you're going to continue to be put in situations that make you feel uncomfortable. And all you can do is learn to get stronger and smarter and savvier and make better choices moving forward. And then we get into chapter four, which is the final chapter of the night. And this chapter is called Garment All Girl. And this is where we meet Luca, a hunky Italian guy that was a total asshole, but an asshole that Margaret loved very much. And that's why she got engaged to him. Bye, Diane. So great to, to have you pop into the live. I'm glad you got to chat with us from down under in Australia. Have a, have a good one. Have a good day. Have a good night. I'm not sure what time it is there in Australia, but love to you, my dear. Anyway, so she marries the hunky Italian guy, Luca, and they were wildly passionate about each other, but he was a total dick and... It was also kind of weird because she said that she would fight with him a lot. And when they would fight, that Marge Sr. would always take Luca's side, which strange, weird. Like if you're her mom, like, why would you be taking his side? But anyway, they were planning their wedding. And then Margaret was just like, I can't do this anymore. You're a total douche caboose. And I just don't, I'm not into you. And I don't want to be with you. Maybe the sex is great. Maybe there's great passion. But like, I just, I don't like you. And I think you're a terrible person. And then Marge Sr. was like, what? You 
you broke up with him, but like you like him and you like his family and like he's a great looking guy. And like, why would you like he's literally willing to marry you? And she's like, yeah, great that he's willing to marry me. But no, thank you. I'm not I don't actually like him. So she left Luca in the dust and then pranced on with her life. And she ended up working a new job or working yeah, a new job at another Bloomingdale's. Apparently that's they have a lot of blooming. Oh, hi from New Zealand. Hi, Gita GM4. Gita GM4. Hey, from Auckland, New Zealand. Yes, let's get it, get it, get it. But so Luca was in the past. She had this new gig at Bloomingdale's. But this time she had another dick of a boss and she even nicknames him Dick in the book. And he also pushed his weight over her and told her that, you know, He's single and basically if she wants, like he can make her life hard or he can make her life easy and he can make her life very easy if she just slept with him, which she did. But again, she was young. She didn't know any better, but she remember, she says that this instance reminded her of um, when she was a young girl and she was about 12 years old. Um. And she remembers that she went to camp with her friend Kelly and that there were some older boys at the camp. They were like 12 years old, but I believe these older boys were like 19 and 20, or I think the youngest one was maybe like 17, but there were these older boys and they were kind of, you know, picking on the girls. And she was like, they probably just wanted like a little field ski. But anyway, one night she was asleep in her bunk and one of the older boys snuck in and he snuck into her bunk and woke her up. And then he made her jerk him off in the middle of the night. And she was like half asleep. And she was like, I don't even know like what's going on or why I have to do this. But he's like, you have to do this. And you can't tell anybody about it because I have a girlfriend. If my girlfriend finds out that she's going to be really hurt by this. I'm like, you don't want to hurt her, right? You don't want to hurt my girlfriend by letting everybody know that I snuck into this bunk and made you jerk me off. Which also like, you have two fucking hands. Why can't you jerk yourself off? Like, I hate hand jobs like to me I'm just like nobody knows how to smooth move the way I know how to smooth move you know like I don't want anybody else doing that like I can handle my own business I don't need to make somebody else do that for me thank you very much but she wasn't allowed to tell anybody and she didn't tell anybody because at the time she like questioned whether or not like she did something wrong or whether she gave him the wrong impression or whether she led him to believe that she was that kind of girl. She's only 12 years old at this point. And she has like this thought process, like, what did I do wrong? How did I invite this type of behavior? And it wasn't that she did anything wrong other than being a girl. And there was a boy that had hormones and didn't know how to control them. But she thought that she had brought it on upon herself. And she's like, that's what abusers do. They make you feel like it's your fault or you somehow invited this or somehow provoked this. And you're the reason this is happening. And she said that she never had told anybody because she was afraid that like if her mother ever found out or if she told her mother that her mother would never let her hang out with Kelly again, which is such an innocent like 12 year old mindset to have to be like, oh my God, I can't tell anybody not because I'm afraid of hurting this girlfriend, but like, because I don't want to like get in trouble for doing this because I did this, even though she didn't really do anything, he kind of made her do it. But she says that it was the same feeling she had when she was with the Bloomingdale's dick of a boss who made her sleep with him. That Like, it was that same feeling of like, did I do something wrong? Like what, like maybe I'm giving you the wrong impression. And listen, I've been in instances with guys where, you know, they've taken advantage or gone beyond what was acceptable with me. Um, and I remember like leaving that situation and kind of like feeling embarrassed and being like, well, fuck, did I lead him on? Did I do something? Like, I know I didn't want that. I know that wasn't appropriate. I know that I didn't ask for that or definitely didn't want it. But like, did I do something wrong? Did I like invite it? Were there advances that were made that I wasn't explicitly clear about that, you know? But then you look at the behavior and you're like, regardless, like, some behavior is just not tolerable and some behavior is not acceptable. Um, but again, you learn, you grow. I mean, it's unfortunate that these things happen, but you learn how to process them and you learn how to build up that confidence isn't the right word, but like that you learn how to get rid of that fear and how to build up that ability to be like, okay, I've recognized this. This is not acceptable. And you learn how to like fight for yourself and stand up for yourself. And that takes, it takes time and it's not very easy. I think people think it's a lot easier and they expect women, especially to be like, oh, well you did want this or you were dressed in a certain way. So you did deserve that or, you know, whatever. But she references other bosses in this chapter, Damien, who she notes is really great. And she really enjoyed working with him. She talks about Jimmy, who, 
she says he never really he never explicitly hit on her but he was all also equally as gross as some of the other ones and like she said that he would call he would have like calls for fit models and he would like have them like dress for him and like be nude in front of him and it was just like very strange and it was just another man like in power like wanting to exude his ability over young impressionable young women that don't know any better but she says that that's the status quo in New York in the 80s that you know people at that point especially young girls like they didn't know any different and men didn't know any different either they just thought you know I am a man I'm in a position of power I can abuse this power and it was common and you don't really you didn't really talk about it and a lot of these things were common that you didn't talk about she said like you know how we just knew that every Thursday night that was you know the dinner Thursday nights were reserved for dinner and for Russian hookers and that's what Thursday nights were for dinner Russian hookers. And she was like, on Monday, I would go and get cash. And they were cash for gifts for the clients. When I don't know if you can, well, I mean, I guess cash is a really nice gift to give a Russian hooker client. But she's like, that's, that's what it did. And we didn't talk about it. it was just like what the bosses did. It was how it was what the culture was. But she closes by saying that she can't decide if those times were easier or if they were harder than they are now, because at least now, at least then, bad behavior was very like transparent. There weren't any hidden agendas. And, you know, it's, it's crazy how much times have changed and times haven't changed. And then she closes this chapter with her last two life lessons for the night. The first one being the only way to break the cycle of abusive behavior is to find the courage to speak up and to seek help and that it's never too late. You can always go to therapy. You can always find ways to, you know, help you process that and help you learn that these things weren't your fault and that, you know, you didn't deserve that and how to make better choices and how to be a better advocate advocate for yourself moving forward and how to process that emotional trauma. She says that she went to therapy, which obviously seemed to be tremendously helpful for her. Her second life lesson from this chapter is to find a mentor who sees as much in you as you see in them. So forget the shitty bosses because there are going to be plenty of them, but find yourself a good boss, a mentor. Says that on her podcast, Caviar Dreams, Tuna Fish Budget, that that was one thing that a lot of the guests often shared was that, you know, they had a mentor, somebody that they looked up to, somebody that helped them, that guided them, that pushed them, that answered questions for them. And so she talks about how that's a really important thing, that despite all the shitty bosses you're going to have, there are some people that can really help you push you and help you grow. And boom, those are the first three chapters of Caviar Dreams, Tuna Fish Budget by Margaret Josephs. Next week, we'll be reading chapters five, six, seven, and eight. Make sure you grab your copy and read your four chapters for next week. Thoughts, feelings, vibes. How are you guys feeling about this new book from Margaret Josephs? I'm pretty sure it's going to get a little more juicy. Obviously, in here, she talks about um, sleeping with her boss, which was a big topic of discussion last season on Real Housewives of New Jersey when Jennifer like tried to weaponize that against Margaret and was like, oh, well, you slept with your boss. You're a slut. And then she's like, you're a concubine. And there was that whole beef, which I'm sure will continue on from there. But th this is or these were the chapters that they were referencing and talking about sleeping with her boss. And I kind of get where Jennifer's coming from because she's like, well, you slept with your boss willingly, didn't you? And Margaret's like, well, yes, I did. But you don't understand that like I was a young girl. I really didn't know any better. It really impacted me. I wish I had it. I wish the culture was different. I wish I didn't feel that pressure to do it. She's like, but you know, it is what it is. Thank you, Chrissy 37 G for the three badges. Thank you, Gossip in a Glass for the three badges. Hi, Debbie Ann 80. Thank you for the two badges, my dear. Looking so fly in this profile picture. Simply me MJ with three, four badges. Look at you, Simply me MJ. I'm loving this little hat you got going on. Get it, get it, get it, girl. And LV Knights Girl. OMG, what is that? Seven, eight, nine, ten badges from LV Knights Girl. What? LV Knights Girl is the MVP of the night. Almost through Jersey season three. Jersey's great. Ooh, season three, season four, season five. Oh, season six is a little strange. But other than that, the first five seasons of Jersey are wild. Hi, Chrissy, 37G. Wow. Wow, what? Hi, Sam. Sam Benjamin, welcome on in.
that's it. Ansley, you're going to bed already. You're done for the night. Ansley, you always say, good night, I'm going to bed. And then 20 minutes later, you're still in the live chat. I'm like, Ansley, where'd you go? Good night, Ansley. We love you. As always, you know we love you. Love you, love you, love you. <laughs> I understand. All right. Good night, Ansley. Any thoughts, feeling by feelings or vibes before we close out of Bravo Book Club for the night? If you guys haven't grabbed your copy, I'm actually excited to read the next four chapters. Let's see. What are the next four chapters even titled? Do, 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 do. You got two copies of the book. My God. I'm so glad you guys convinced me to watch. Hi, sunshine. Okay. Chapter five is daddy issues. Not. Chapter six is just add water. Chapter seven is icing on the cake. And chapter eight is birth on the kitchen table. Oof. Those sound sassy. Oh, you finished the whole book. Wow. You're an overachiever. Arnie Tavares. Well, I'm excited for the next four chapters. Guys, this book was a good choice. It is a really good book. I enjoyed these first four chapters. Copies in the mail. All right, Christine. Well, you know what to catch up on. I'll get the audiobook and catch up. Smart, sunshine, smart. Get that audiobook. All right, guys. Well, I hope you've had a wonderful week. I hope if you're joining me on the sugar detox, it has started off well so far. Um, call me old fashioned, but I don't do audible. I actually think that that's commendable to not do audible and to do the hard copy book. I mean, I love a good hard copy. All right, guys. Thank you for joining Bravo Book Club tonight. I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you for all the badges. You guys are so awesome. The bomb.com. We came in with 13 badges. Wowzers. 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 I made a mess in my trousers. 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 Not really. But anyway, hope you guys have had a wonderful start to your week and a wonderful start to the new year. I will talk to you guys on Thursday. We have a new episode of the podcast on Wednesday breaking down a lot more of this Mary Cosby stuff, yikesies. And then Thursday, we're going to be going live, 6.30 p.m. Pacific, 9.30 Eastern, just like we do every Thursday. So I will catch you there. Love you. Good night, LV Nights girl. Good night, guys. Love you, love you. Mean it. Wow, so many people are joining in and we're just wrapping up the live. Well, you guys can always give me a follow at Just Plain Zach, my personal account. Keep up with the show at No Filter with Zach. And if you want to watch us on the YouTube, all these lives get rebroadcast on the YouTube. You can always give us a subscribe at youtube.com slash just plain Zach. Good night, Kenny. Good night, LV Nights girl. Good night, Christine. Good night, Alicia. Good night, Gossip in a Glass. I'll see you on Thursday. And Thursday we'll do after party. All right, good night, guys. Bye.